Welcome. I would like to tell everybody, although it's been the pandemic for two years, this is my first Zoom I have ever done. <laughs> so most of everything I do being a clinician, it's either telehealth or in person and mostly in person. Um, everything else I've watched Zoom, but I've never participated. So here we go for my first one. Um, and we're going to make it a doozy because it's about sex and your health. Um, I Let me tell you a little bit about myself first. I am a practicing urogynecologist. And what does that mean? That means that I can focus on the entire reproductive check for a woman. Um, I only have female patients. And that would be about the uterus, the ovaries, the vagina, the bladder. Um, I go, I, I focus on anything from like menstrual cycle to urinary incontinence and prolapse and of course, sexual health, which leads us to the topic of today. So I was asked to present about sex in your health, which is always a fun topic. Okay, so these are our slides. And the first thing I wanna talk about are the benefits of, of sex. There are a multitude of benefits for sex, but I'm gonna focus on physical, emotional, psychological, and social. And I thought social, hmm, we'll get into that. <laughs> okay, the physical benefits for sex are that it can lower blood pressure. It lowers blood pressure in a number of ways. One, because it's activity. So you're having intercourse, it's similar, very similar to having, to walking at a slow or moderate pace. Um, and that's actually how you look at it for women. And if you look at how many, um, they're called METs, I believe, it's how many calories you burn per minute um, in terms of like uh, when, you, when you're working out either for walking or running. And so for men, you burn four calories. Um, yes, we can all assume that men work harder. <laughs> so if you're working out and you're having sex, if, well, you're having sex and it's similar to working out, then that's going to have an overall health benefit on your blood pressure. It also has a benefit on your heart, right? Because your heart's going to be going faster when you climax during orgasm. That also helps with the strength of your heart and the ability to pump blood. And all of that is an aerobic exercise. So we have reducing calories, um, increasing heart health. It strengthens muscles because it's physical. It's very similar to walking or, or um, another moderate type of exercise where your muscles are contracting and relaxing. And depending on how long you have intercourse for, it can have long lasting sustained benefits. Um, and you get in a better immune health system. And we'll talk a little bit about more about that in the next slide, but um, your immune system can be for a variety of reasons. One, because it does promote good endorphins. It can give you um, an increase in prolactin, you get better sleep. Um, and then of course, exposure to someone else's um, germs, either viruses or bacteria, boosts your immunity anyway. There's also, and we'll talk about it, actually I'll talk more about that on the next slide. It can decrease depression and anxiety. And that, that has to do with the fact that intercourse is a bonding relationship where you're, you're physically attached with somebody, you're having a relationship. There's a lot about intimacy and other things that are going on during intercourse. And those all produce feelings of um, where you're, you're producing chemicals and, and having bonding interactions, and that does decrease depression. You're with another person, so you feel a little bit more safe. Um, an immediate natural pain reliever. So having intercourse increases your endorphins. So your brain actually produces chemicals that are very similar in the structure of, of, um, of morphine. So morphine is a pain killer. It's a pain reducer. And our body has a natural ability to make that. This is what we people call as runner's high when they're running and they get um, their endorphins are increased. And so during intercourse, those are produced. So, sorry, that top, there it is. I've got the little glitch there, your immune system. So I mentioned briefly on another slide that your immune system is increased when you have intercourse. And the reason for that is they took some saliva samples from people who had intercourse um, at a higher frequency than other people than another group of people who had intercourse. And when they looked at the saliva, were IgA, which is a, an immune um, antibody, um, and an antibody means that um, I'll I'll explain for a second. An antibody is something that our body produces that helps fight off infection, so it gives us some immunity. So it's a nice way to kind of see 
if those levels are elevated or not elevated, because it can be a marker of how good your immune system is. And they noticed that people who had intercourse more often than other people, that was elevated in their saliva samples. I think there could be a couple of reasons for that. One could be the fact that um, your body's actually in a, in a better state. Um, something else could be is that, you know, during intercourse, you know, you might be kissing somebody, maybe you're kissing their skin or you're having other kind of kissing mouth to mouth and the interaction of, of bacteria that you're exposed to has your body naturally produce more immune system, which can have long lasting effects. And then hormones. The hormones during intercourse go crazy. Um, there are lots of studies that say if you hug someone for 15 seconds or more, your prolactin goes up. So what's prolactin? Prolactin is a brain chemical that is produced when you're feeling really good. It's the chemical that's produced when a mom has a baby and she's holding the baby. And studies have shown that if the mom just looks at the baby in her arms, those levels go up. Those levels are... Prolactin is something that is, sorry, my dog's having, <laughs> he's running around, part of Zoom. Um, so prolactin is something, is a hormone that's produced from your head, uh, the brain, the pituitary, and it can be stimulated by a number of reasons. One of the reasons could be that it's stimulated from being, getting hugged. And if you hug someone for 15 seconds or more, those chemicals go up. Another reason the chemical could go up is because you're having intercourse and you're holding somebody. And those are feel good hormones. Those hormones have long lasting effects on the body of decreasing blood pressure, which takes us back to the physical effects of relaxation and of bonding. They actually help people bond more. Um, it's just the way that it interacts with, with your brain. Um, and, and that's also important if you think about it for when moms have babies and they're looking at the baby, if that hormone goes up, that's automatically chemically strengthening a bond between a mother and her infant. And you take that, that type of a hormone and it, if it's increased during intercourse, then you're having more of a bonding relationship with your partner. Endorphins, we talked about that. Those are the chemicals that are very similar to uh, runners when they get their runners high. And it's a, mole a molecule that's very similar to morphine. Those are the, the, the medicines that doctors give when we do surgery so that you don't feel us doing surgery, right? So these are, they really definitely decrease pain. So a lot of people say, you know, having, having sex can just decrease your pain, maybe some arthritis, maybe some discomfort and some stress because endorphins will take care of all of that. Also increases serotonin. Serotonin, that's what links into depression. So we all know that when serotonin is a little bit low, you can feel blue or sad. So having intercourse, if it's going to increase your serotonin levels, then you're going to feel a lot better. And so you're, yeah, there's more euphoria. And this is a really interesting one. There's some studies that are coming out more recently about male men and prostate cancer. So men who ejaculate more than 21 times per month compared to those who, who ejaculate four to seven times per month, they were less likely to develop prostate cancer. Um, it has to be an ejaculation. It's just not intercourse. An ejaculation could be through penetration of intercourse, or it could even be with masturbation. But they think that just the seminal fluid actually being ejaculated and coming out is what decreases prostate cancer. So sex is good for everybody. Semen content. So when you have intercourse, if you're not using a condom, and I always recommend a condom if you're in a relationship that one, either you're not wanting to get pregnant or two, um, you haven't been STD tested. And semen content has testosterone, estrogen, and prolactin has some prostaglandin and some other components as well, but I thought these three were the most important. Testosterone is interesting because um, if you're ejaculating into a woman, that testosterone is gonna be absorbed and that's a hormone that kind of gives you a little bit of friskiness. So women need that. Um, we have our own testosterone, but we obviously don't have it at levels as high as men um, because that's the male dominant hormone. But testosterone helps with the sex drive. So if that's happening, then women can have a higher sex drive from that. I'm not sure if it's statistically significant, but it's interesting to know. It also, semen also has a little bit of estrogen, which women have as a predominant component and prolactin, again, that bonding hormone, that hormone that helps a couple really seal the relationship and in having intercourse. And that's it. Um, I'm not sure how many participants there are. So 
um, if there are any questions. Otherwise, I might just go into some tangents about, um, about sex and your health. We get when I give this topic in this lecture and it's, and it's more in person. So people, you know, people start to open up and really ask a lot of questions. And it's always the first question, the one that, you know, breaks the ice for everybody. And the question is, is, you know, why do men want sex more than women? Right. Um, and, and it's a tough topic, right? Because I think that's a problem in long-term relationships that I see in my, my practice is women, you know, are in these long-term relationships, you know, sex has become less of an interest for them. And there's a lot of reasons why men, you know, men and women have different uh, sexual appetites as, as time goes on in a, in a monogamous relationship. Um, first of all, in the first two years of a relationship, what happens is the um, novelty of the relationship or the newness of a relationship definitely decreases after two years. So when you look at MRIs of the brain on, two, on a couple, the first two years, the, the receptors in the brain and the receptors are, I think of them as, as like um, little, maybe, maybe like little cups or little dishes that are, that are waiting for something to fill it up. Like it, you know, you wanna put cereal in a bowl or milk in a cup. And so these receptors are waiting for things. And what they wait for are things like serotonin that are increased during intercourse, right? Um, they're waiting for um, dopamine. These are, these are chemicals that are in the brain that are pleasure chemicals. And so in the first two years of a relationship, those hormones are really high. And all those little bowls or dishes are like all open and waiting, um, probably uh, you know, just, just saying, okay, I'm here, fill, fill me up, stimulate me. When it drops inside the bowl, it gets satisfied then it, the chemical, the serotonin um, molecule will kind of di um, disappear, it kind of gets used. And then the receptor opens back up for another little chemical to drop in. So every time you see your new partner, you get all excited, you, get, you can't wait, the girls are you know, getting ready, the guys are getting ready, you can't wait to get to your date. And over the first two years, you have all that excitement. And so if you do MRIs of the brain, you can see that all these receptor areas in the brain are actually lit up. After about two years, those receptors kind of get bored. They're like, oh, I'm getting the same one. I'm getting the same one. And they start to decrease. So we see that after two years in, in, in relationships, the pat patterns in the brain chemically can change. Now, when you look at that, <clears throat> so you think, okay, in, in a chemical way, then these are the changes that can happen in the brain. How do we stop those from happening? Um, so because those chemicals decrease, you do have to work on the relationship. So what happens is, is, is mother nature helps two, two people procreate by keeping those hormones really high in the first two years and, it, and the chance of procreation and, and having children to propagate, right? It's kind of an evolutionary procreation you know, drive that we have. And as that decreases, what should happen is there should be a, a transfer of a relationship that is based on trust and, and other, other factors of, of just regular relationships. And um, after that, then you go ahead and you continue to build other experiences of pleasure and happiness. Um, I'll go ahead and answer that question since now it's, it's on my mind. Um, let me look at it one more time to make sure I'm answering it correctly. How can I pull that up? Ah, here it is about fibroids. So the question is from our audience, fibroids cause bleeding during intercourse. Okay, fibroids do not cause bleeding during intercourse. Um, bleeding during intercourse can be a lot of different reasons. Um, one, you could be starting your menstrual cycle. Two, you can, you can be pregnant. Three, you can have a, an infection, whether it's a vaginal infection of bacteria called bacterial vaginosis, or it's a chlamydia, or it's a gonorrhea, those types of infections can cause bleeding during intercourse. Um, when you have fibroids, fibroids bleed hormonally um, and, and, bleed, and bleed without hormones as well, for sure. Um, but having intercourse does not make a fibroid bleed um, unless you have a fibroid that is actually being, um, the position of it is being um, kind of, I, I guess uh, we call it a prolapsing fibroid. So if it's prolapsing fibroid, then the penis would, would hit it, would touch it, and that could cause bleeding. 
And, and fibroid location depends, but I don't have patients that say every time I have intercourse, my fibroids bleed. Fibroids bleed because you get your menstrual cycle and you continue bleeding and you don't stop. Um, and then you can absolutely bleed outside of, of a menstrual cycle with fibroids, but intercourse doesn't cause fibroids to bleed. Let's see, there's another chat. Okay. <clears throat> Oh, this is an interesting question. What are, the what are the benefits and disadvantages of circumcision versus no circumcision? And what is the current thought on circumcision in infants? Oh gosh, it's been a long time since I've done a circumcision on an infant. Um, so circumcisions, you know, they're the thought that I understand, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm not very well read on the literature for that. So I'm not sure I can speak as an expert in circumcisions. I'll tell you what I do know. Um, when I was doing um, obstetrics back in 2004 to 2008, about 90% of all of my babies that I delivered that were boys had circumcisions. Um, and the thought was that, you know, it was cleaner, it was neater, um, and it was just easier. Uh, and looking at some of the literature, the foreskin of the, of the, uh, of the uh, penis when it's removed, leaves the penis without as much sensation. So from what I understand, and I, and I haven't really reviewed the literature on that, is the difference is that um, sexual function or sexual pleasure. Um, but I don't, I don't know the actual like numbers as to, as to what that difference would be, especially in a, in a society where a majority, I think, of the men do have circumcisions. I'm not sure. I think we would have to, I would have to read some stuff on, on what those differences are. Since I've done circumcisions, so well, 2004 to 2008 or nine, that's, oh my gosh, that's what, 13 years ago. I'm not sure what the circumcision rate in hospitals are at this time. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing circumcisions, almost all of the children had, all, the, all of the boys had circumcisions. Um, you know, it's, Part of it is, is a thought and, you know, whether it's, it's actually folklore or, or folktale that, you know, you have less infections. I think, I tend to think if you're not taught to clean the, um, when you retract the foreskin of a penis, if you're not taught to clean well and hygiene, then it can definitely cause your recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, you know, and speaking to my urologist friends, they say that, you know, adult circumcisions are so difficult or more painful because you know, obviously it's an adult and they have more ability to, to feel and, and to express the pain. Um, you know, we don't really know what infants feel when they have circumcisions because they, they're not verbal. Um, when I did my circumcisions, I always gave, gave anesthetic um, to the baby and I fed them sugar water to keep them pacified. And so it was, you know, we, we really try to keep it where the infant was very, very comfortable. It's a very quick procedure for, for an infant. Um, it took me maybe oh, probably three to five minutes to, to, you know, actually from start to end um, for my circumcisions that I did on my babies. So um, it would be the least uncomfortable for them. But I don't know more than that, unfortunately. Um, did you have any thoughts on that that we can talk about? I know that typically in families, um, the circumcision is based on dad, you know, so that it's it's just... You know, it's hard for a mom to teach a son to, to clean if the dad doesn't know how to do it, but that is an issue. Um, I, do, I do know somebody in my family, which was a very big deal, who didn't get circumcised. And, you know, my mom was besides her, <laughs> herself. <laughs> she thought it was just, you know, so old fashioned not to circumcise. And I, you know, I, I thought it was okay. Um, and um, this person ended up with, you know, a couple of infections, but after a while, you know, they really learned, you know, after, you know, I, I believe the, the gentleman was a teenager. And after a couple of infections, he learned really quick <laughs> how to stay clean, <laughs> you know, but for little kids, I'm not sure, you know, if that's something that's, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, but I know he had it when he was quite a bit older. Um, but I'm not sure I know that there are infections, um, either urinary tract or even just with the skin. I also know that sometimes you can pull the foreskin a little bit more um, you know, if, if you're not really, um, if you really aren't taught how to do it or know how to do it, it can be uncomfortable. So those are things that I know have to be taught, which might be difficult if the father is not circumcised and the son 
the father is circumcised and the son is not because that's hard to teach somebody if you don't know it, I would think, but I'm not really sure. I know that um, a, a while ago, and it's been a long time since I've looked at this literature, but I have read it, um, that HPV and viruses um, can be more easily transmitted with circumcised men. So I know the STD rate is a little bit higher with um, uncircumcised men than with circumcised men. Um, and uh, they looked at, um, if I remember correctly, and I really have to go back and review the literature, but I wasn't, I, I want to say that HPV on the preface or the, you know, the foreskin of the, of the male was a little bit higher, but I'd have to go back and look at that literature again. I do know that the transmission of STDs is definitely higher. All right. Thank you very much. That was very informative. That's, you know, the urologist would be uh, much better to answer that question because I don't have a male population. Um, they would be somebody who, you know, would see the babies or, you know, uh, bad circumcisions or, you know, having a population of men who have, who have not had circumcisions and would have those complications. But since I have mainly a female population, you know, I only hear what the girls say. <laughs> <laughs> and they and whether they complain or not complain about circumcised or uncircumcised men. And honestly, I, I my patients, that's never really a topic. My my female patients never say, oh, I'm having intercourse with a male who's uncircumcised, and it's 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 this or that. It's actually never really been a topic that I can remember. So most of my patients, when it comes to sex, it depends, it really the questions I find really depend on the age range of the patient. So when I have my young patients, typically the, the questions that I'm getting from my young patients are, um, I have pain with intercourse. So typically my young patients present with pain during intercourse, and I'm not sure why, um, but that's, that's a common um, topic with my younger women. And you know what goes hand in hand for me, my, one of my very first questions you know, after I get to know my patient is, is there a history of sexual abuse? Um, and sometimes there is, uh, you know, so we have to address that and make sure that they're comfortable with their bodies, right? So these are young women who are really, um, you know, exploring intercourse with, you know, with their partner, and it may be their first or their second partner, and they have um, body image, um, you know, insecurities, or even just insecurities in the bedroom or you know, male anatomy. Um, and then they might have, um, you know, trauma from, you know, previous um, um, sexual abuse, or even, you know, just emotional abuse that's sexually related. So we talk about those issues and how to be comfortable with our bodies. I talk to a lot of women in their 50s, who've never even looked at their bodies, you know, so we, you know, I always draw pictures for my young girls and make sure they understand their anatomy, basic anatomy, which I, I, I didn't put any pictures up. Um, but their uh, labia, you know, the, the, the lips on the outside are the, called the labia majora. Those are the ones that have hair. Then the ones on the inside are the soft fleshy ones. They're kind of like the inside of your mouth. They're just very, very soft and, and wet. And those are the labia minora. And at the tip of it is the clitoris. And, you know, I always remind girls that's, you know, that's where if you touch that and rub that, that's where you could, and that's masturbation, you could have an orgasm. And, I, and some women don't know that, young girls and older women. Um, so I go over basic anatomy with my young girls. We talk about sexual abuse. We talk about orgasm. I'm always very, very, I, I always make sure I, I emphasize with all of my patients, but especially my young ones that my battery's running low. Let me see what happened. Hold on one second. Let me just make sure my battery's plugged in. It got unplugged. Give me a second. Okay, so I always make sure that my young patients and my older patients, but usually the ones that are that are are just engaging in intercourse may have, you know, just, you know, in their early 20s, that they're comfortable that they learn how to say no, you know, and, and, and even my teens that I see on occasion, you know, and I always remind them that during sex, it's a mutually, it's a mutual interaction, you know, you should never feel guilty. Um, and you should never let someone, you know, tell you that intercourse is you know, something that they have to do and that you can say no. And um, if a boy doesn't like you or a man or gentleman doesn't like you that, you know, that's okay. You know, that you have to feel comfortable with, with what you're doing and, and this acts of intercourse, right? Because there's lots of acts of intercourse um, that you have to be comfortable with what you're asked to do or that you're a participant in. You know, so I always talk about safe sex with my patients um, and how to, 
you know, so how to protect themselves. And I always ask them, do you, are you happy in your relationship? You know, do you feel abused? Um, so that's, that's a big thing for, you know, talking to my patients. And then we talk about, um, you know, using condoms, how to use a condom. Um, I always tell my, I always tell my young girls, this is always kind of funny. I always tell them this and, and they always laugh. This is, this is really cute. I say, you know, you get these boys and, and you start kissing and you turn off the lights and you close your eyes and you have sex. I'm like, you have no idea what their penis looks like. <laughs> you don't know if pus is coming out of the tip of the head of the penis or they have herpes sores all over or if little things are scurrying and crawling around. And I remind these girls, I say, you know, don't forget, you know, a man is putting himself into your body. So you have to really, you know, turn on the lights, open your eyes and take a look. If you're old enough to have intercourse, you're old enough to look and see what your partner looks like, right? And so that you're safe because, you know, I've seen some girls that come in and, you know, unfortunately they've, they end up with some bad infections. So STDs are very important. I remind them that condoms don't always prevent all, all types of STDs, right? Herpes can, is skin to skin and HPV is as well, you know, so, and you have to put the condom on the moment the penis goes inside of you. So I talk about sex for that, for my younger girls and my older women, if they have questions or they're having new relationships. Um, and then of course, throughout the, you know, the, the um, span of a woman's life, right? So you have young girls whose libido is high, their orgasm is strong. Um, and as we get into our forties, that changes a little bit. And when you get into menopause and estrogen is, is gone, you know, you're in menopause, you're not producing estrogen at any rate. Um, if you're lucky to have the level of five on some of my blood values for my patients without being supplemented, it's very hard to get a libido. You're in this long-term relationship. And I explained earlier that after two years, you know, all those feel good hormones are, are pretty much gone in a relationship. So if you're in menopause, sex is very, very different. Um, estrogen is gone. There's vaginal dryness. There's pain. The vagina is less elastic. Um, it can be uncomfortable. Some women, they stop orgasming. Some women have very little orgasms. Very, some women, um, it's painful because they're dry. So we talk about sex. Um, so in my menopausal patients, um, we talk about intercourse in a different way. And I, I can't, I can't tell you how many women will ask me, how do I get my libido back? You know, they're in menopause and they're like, you know, I, I, I would love to want to have sex. You know, they just don't, they just don't think about it. So I, for those women, I tell them the more sex you have, the more sex you'll want. You just kind of have to force yourself. You know, you have to watch a romantic movie um, and you have to create episodes for intercourse. You know, you have to work harder. You know, I, I say it's very similar to when I was younger. If I wanted to lose five pounds, I would skip a meal or two. Now that I'm older, I've got to skip a whole week of meals. You know, we just, our bodies are changing. And so when we are in menopause, intercourse becomes different because, you know, you're not having as strong of an orgasm. Sometimes you're not having any orgasm. So the positive feedback for intercourse may not be there. However, you're still producing the feel good hormones, right? The prolactin, you're still increasing, you know, some of your testosterone, your estrogen, and those are really important. So I tell my patients, create scenarios um, to have intercourse, right? C you know, plan a romantic night, you know, plan a romantic dinner, you know, have the kids go away. Don't babysit the grandkids, whatever it is. And then be prepared. You know, you might have some vaginal dryness, so you might need some lubrication. Some of my favorite lubrications are some water-based um, um, lubrications. I like Sliquid. Um, and I also like Astroglide and Astroglide can be found in almost every, um, you know, supermarket or Osco, Walmart, uh, Jewel type of uh, areas. Um, I like that because it's got a really high viscosity and it doesn't tend to dry out as much. Um, so that's one of my favorite. I like some silicone based products, but they can be irritating to some women. Um, I do not use Vaseline or petroleum jelly type uh, products for intercourse because having petroleum jelly or mineral oil based mm -hmm. um, product inside the vagina can cause bacteria. You want something water-based or something that's definitely like, even a, a light silicone is okay, but something that your body can process and, and, and get rid of. You don't need to douche to get rid of it. It will naturally come out of the vagina. So I, I remind them, you know, be prepared, you know, have some, have some lubrication, um, make sure you have enough foreplay, you know, 
as, as a woman gets older, she needs to be revved up a little bit more. It's, it's not going to be like a light switch. It's, you know, guys tend to have a libido much longer than women and a higher sex drive because they have a different hormone. And I always tell my patients this because they feel my, my female patients tend to feel really guilty. I'm in this great relationship, but I just don't feel like having sex. And I tell them, I say, well, you know what? It's really interesting because women go through menopause and our, and our, our sex hormone is estrogen. So when we're young, it's up here. When we go through menopause, it's gone, right? We don't have any, unless we're taking some supplements, which can supplement, but they're really not exactly like what we've ever had, right? And our body has changed. Men, their testosterone's here and their testosterone's here, right? So we're, we're aging at the same time, but, they're, but their hormones don't change. So sorry, men, I'm so sorry. You have to close your ears for a second. So I tell my female patients, if we castrated men, they would understand what we go through during menopause, but that doesn't happen to them. So they can't understand. So it's harder. You know, we, you know, our men have hormones that push them. Um, they, they, it drives them and, and they have the natural ability. They don't have to think about it because their hormones say, I'm ready for sex. This is great. Right. And women were like, oh my God, where'd my hormone go? Let me, let me see if I can look this up and read on something. You know, we have to work at it. Um, and we also, I always tell my patients too, how's your relationship? I ask my women, how is your relationship with your partner? Are you happy? Because happier couples have more sex. Unhappy couples don't. And then I, and they tell me, I'm not that happy in my relationship. You know, I work all day. I come home. I have to cook dinner. You know, I'm already tired. I'm hungry and I'm cooking and I'm, I'm snacking and I'm eating bad food. And then I have to cook and then I have to do the dishes and then I have to clean the table and then I have to do the homework with the kids. And then I have to do this. And then I have to do that. And then I have to go to bed and have sex. It's one more job for them. So I always tell them, well, if you want to have better sex and your husband needs to, or your partner, your male partner needs to do the dishes or your, whoever your, your partner is. And I'm, I'm only talking about heterosexual partners because I think the conversation takes a different turn if I have to include all, all different sex couples. So pardon me, my apologies for keeping it, uh, for keeping it heterosexual. Um, so, you know, I do tell my patients that, you know, you have to look at your relationship. If, if you're really, you know, having issues, then, you know, that's something that you do have to talk about because that directly impacts your happiness and your, and your desire to be intimate with somebody. You know, if you're tired and you're, and you're, you know, you're cleaning the kitchen and you're washing the dishes and you're mopping the floor and you're feeding the kids and your partner's watching football or your partner is taking a nap or your partner is able to do something else that you feel is more pleasurable than what you're doing, that may, they may cause some disharmony between you two. And, you know, long-term, unfortunately, it's going to affect your sex, your sex relationship. And, and I see that in my patients. So we talk about, you know, if they wanted to do um, couples counseling, then I, I, I recommend them to you know, couples counseling um, for, for them, for their sex drive. And that, that can help with that a lot. But it, sometimes it, takes, it just takes work. Um, you know, we don't have the hormones. Um, I, don't, I don't give hormones as a prescription for sex drive because they don't work. I know that there are some off-label uses for testosterone and testosterone pelleting for women. Um, I know people who do it and I, they, have, they have success rates with it. Um, the literature is, is all over the place for that. Um, and it's not recommended. Um, it's not something that our college, the American um, ob College uh, recommends. So it's definitely off-label. I know I've given it in the past as an off-label. I've had hit or miss success rates. Um, it's really, you know, for women, it's really about, you know, just creating moments and, and uh, having a good relationship. And, uh, and then again, you know, the more sex a woman has, we especially as she gets older, um, the more she'll be able to orgasm, the better her orgasms will be, the more interested in sex she'll be. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, because when a woman does have sex, especially in the menopause time frame, what happens is our blood flow and our blood supply to the pelvic area, um, it decreases somewhat during the menopause time. And as you're having more intercourse and your, your clitoris is being stimulated and your and vagina is being stimulated, start. there is more... Um, there's more blood flow to that area. And as you get more blood flow, that tissue degenerates and gets healthier. And so it continues and it's just a cycle that kind of propagates on itself. Did that answer your question? Oh, there's a chat. Okay, let's see. When do females start 
um, decreasing releasing eggs. Since women are delaying pregnancy, are you seeing more endometriosis and infertility? Okay, this is kind of a multi-pieced uh, uh, question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it apart a little bit. When do females stop um, uh, releasing so many eggs? So when a woman is born and created in embryologically, she is born with the amount of eggs that she will have for the rest of her life. So that, that baby comes out and she is already destined to have X amount of eggs, whatever that is. And that's typically genetic. So she will go from infancy to puberty. So when she hits menarche, menarche is when she starts having her first period, she starts producing eggs. Now, between um, menarche, which could, you know, which is getting younger and younger um, for a variety of reasons, um, not for this lecture, um, when she starts menstruating to maybe about 16 and sometimes even older, that, uh, that access that's called the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary access, which is where a little part in the brain talks to another little part of the brain, that little part of the brain goes and talks to the ovaries and the ovaries talk back. It's just like when you get on the phone and you talk to your girlfriend and you have like another call and you, you have all your friends on a group chat, right? So there's a group chat between your two parts of your brain and your ovaries and they all kind of communicate. And sometimes they get angry and then you don't ovulate. And so that, that happens during the teenage years that that system just has to mature. So you're not, you might not be producing eggs all the time, um, but, <clears throat> but you're producing them and your body's kind of just getting used to becoming a woman. Um, within your 20, typically within the 20s and 30s, you're producing eggs at a normal rate and for the most for the general population, right? For people who don't have issues, let's just say. Um, so they're producing eggs every month. A typical menstrual cycle, uh, typical can be every 28 days, leading from three to seven days um, would be considered normal with small variations on, on those. We'll have several days for menstrual cycle length and several days for cycle length. Um, if anyone ever really thought about it, right? I mean, I'm sure you have. Uh, the menstrual cycle is very similar to our lunar cycle. It's very interesting, but that's a whole different lecture as well. <laughs> so you get into your 20s and your 30s and you start menstruating regularly and typically you ovulate one egg every month. Um, one month it's the left ovary, the other month it's the right ovary. Typically they alternate. Um, and I always say, you know, God gave us two, two, two eight ovaries because if we lose one, then the other ovary will produce an egg the rest of the life. When you hit your 40s, ovulation starts to change. Your menstrual cycle starts to change. You can have hot flashes and perimenopausal changes that happen from the 40s into the 50s. And the average age of menopause is 51 in America um, with some variations. I mean, I have, I have some patients that are in their early 60s that are still menstruating. We check them hormonally every six months and they're not in menopause. Um, so we definitely make sure that, uh, <clears throat> that those patients um, I'm sorry. So in the 40s, you start to you can you can start missing menstrual cycles um, or missing ovulation because your menstrual cycles start to get shorter. They start to come a little bit closer. When you hit your late 40s, you start to miss a few, and you become perimenopausal. And perimenopause can be anywhere from one year to several years. And that's just when your periods are a little bit less predictable and irregular, and you may not be ovulating. Um, so you can have some what's called anovulatory cycles where you just menstruate but there's no actual egg that's ever produced by a woman's body to get pregnant. Um, when, um, so that's the perimenopausal time. So that's when you really start decreasing your, your egg production. Um, when I was um, doing ob more frequently and um, what I remember from the literature and I haven't reviewed it recently. So I'm gonna talk about literature I've read maybe five to 10 years ago, um, egg production um, can start to change about 35. So when I get my patients who are looking to get pregnant and they're 35, I, I, I start becoming a little more aggressive with them in terms of you haven't gotten pregnant in six months, I send them to the infertility doctor to work up. Um, I might do some basic work up like an ultrasound and some blood tests and you know STD testing, um, which includes HIV and syphilis and hepatitis. And I might do that just to make sure their baselines are okay but they can start having ovulation issues and other issues. So I'm a little more aggressive than I would be for my patient who's in her thirties or early thirties. And in the forties, automatically, if they're not pregnant within a few months, they go, they go to infertility because um, at 40, the egg production definitely drops and fertility rates um, just, they, they, they turn into an upward uh, cycle. So since women are delaying pregnancy, are you seeing more endometriosis? Not more endometriosis because it's not related to egg production, but it is related to infertility. 
And yes, my patients are delaying. I have, I have quite a number of patients who are 39 and 41, 42 who want to get pregnant. Um, in fact, I just, well, one of my patients, I've been taking care of her for several years. And I told her a couple of years ago, probably about three years ago, she doesn't have a partner and she was waiting for her, you know, the love of her life to come in to have a baby. I said, don't wait for the love of your life. Go freeze your eggs. <laughs> you know, 36 year old eggs or 37 year old eggs are better than 41 year old eggs. And she said, no, no, I want to do this naturally. And I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. So she, I saw her a few months ago and she said, okay, I haven't found the love of my life. And I think she's either 40 or 41. And she says, I want to get pregnant. Oh, where were you four years ago? Where is this, this mindset? So I called my friend who was an infertility doctor and, you know, she's, I think she's self-paid, right? She's self-paid because she has a, she has an insurance that doesn't cover infertility and infertility coverage in Illinois is amazing. They cover four rounds of, of infertility. So anyway, hers doesn't for, for religious reasons. And um, I said, you know, you're out of pocket. It's really expensive. Um, let me see what I can do for you here in the office setting before you go to a specialist, because then the rates are just ex, you know, expensive. So we ran a, a blood test called AMH, which is anti-malarian hormone. And I, I forget, I have to look at it because I've only had to run it once. I've read about it and it helps predict how many eggs are left in an ovary. And, and please don't ask me, but I have to go back and read, and read my notes about that because I've only had to run it once and it was a few months ago and she had a phenomenal number. And so I was, you know, I was jumping up and down. And I texted her. I was like, your numbers are great. Go see him. He said, it's worth it. So she's, uh, she's in the process now. So we can all send good vibes for her. Hope she gets pregnant. Um, and so uh, that's a good way of, of predicting your eggs. Um, if you're having infertility issues, or if you're in an age that, you know, you want to know whether or not you, you know, it's worthwhile pursuing um, an IVF or an in vitro uh, is IVF or an insemination. Now, when it comes to endometriosis, endometriosis is just a whole different story. I did not include it in sex in our health. It is a part of pelvic pain. <clears throat> and so a lot of patients who show up and have endometriosis, you know, they show up with pain during intercourse, um, pain with menstrual cycle. Um, they're, it, it's definitely um, uncomfortable and they can, have, they can have fertility issues. Now, whether or not they have difficulties in producing eggs is very different. Because endometriosis are the glands from inside the uterus and they're, they're all over the, the body. They're, they're kind of like, um, let's say if I grew hair on the side of my cheek and I shouldn't, right? So I'm growing hair here and I'm growing hair on my neck. So endometriosis is the glands from the uterus and it's on the side of the abdomen here and it's on the side of the, and then they all bleed. So, you know, if I'm growing hair here, it shouldn't, right? Because it's active. And, it, you know, for endometriosis, it's having those implants or those glands, um, I, sh I should say is probably an easier term to use in different areas of, of the body and they're bleeding. So it's like you're bleeding inside your belly and it's very painful. And that happens during a cycle um, and they can produce cysts. So it can impact um, fertility if you have the ovaries that have um, what we call endometriomas. And they look like these big chocolate, like Hershey's chocolate melted. In a, in, a, in a balloon type of sac, and that's an endo. So your, your ovary may not function well if it has that on it, or if it has endometriosis, endometrial implants, or you might have infertility from endometriosis because the endometriosis is around a fallopian tube and you have scarring. So those are things that are very, very different. And then how would that impact sex? I mean, you can orgasm normally, but you may not, you know, you may not enjoy penetration because as the penis enters in, it's hitting um, all this, the, the ligaments that have these implants around them and they're getting stretched and it's very, very painful. So painful intercourse, you know, definitely means a woman doesn't want to have sex, right? You know, why would she want to go through that? So some of my patients present with that and the treatment is um, you can do birth control pills and keep them from menstruating and keep and hormonally kind of calm down all those implants. Um, there are some good endometriosis experts who do surgery um, there's a lot of literature that are coming out now that surgery is just, you know, it's, 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 it's both um, good and bad. And, you know, I, it's hard because endometriosis, they always, the, the analogy for endometriosis in the abdomen is like um, an iceberg. You only see the tip. So even if you resect or you, you surgically remove what you see, we think that there's so much more underneath. And so it's, it's, a, it's endometriosis is definitely a difficult thing for women. 
Um, and there are, there are people who are actually endometriosis experts in Chicago who are phenomenal. I am not an endometriosis expert. Um, I'm a pelvic reconstructive surgeon um, and, I, and I, that I'm an expert in. Um, so I, I tend to, if my patient really has an issue with endometriosis, I do refer them out to somebody who I think can help them. And if they're infertility endometriosis, I automatically send them to the reproductive endocrinology um, surgeon or I'm sorry, uh, an endocrinologist to help them get pregnant. And they might do like a uh, tubal surgeries or they might just go straight for IVF. I had a really nice young lady who had horrible endometriosis and um, I did refer her to my two friends. I did take her to the operating room um, because she had an emergency a rupture of a chocolate cyst. Um, and then after that, you know, she, uh, she did go to other people to help her conceive um, or to try to get pregnant and someone else to help her with surgery. Very complicated. It's, that's, that's, a, that's a very, you know, if you have somebody who has that, it can be definitely life-changing and, and their life revolves around that. Did that answer your question? I would hope. Let's see what else, no other questions. Um, so, you know, when we look at, um, and I didn't put these as slides, um, I wasn't sure how much time I'd have to talk or, and, um, and what the questions would be. So I like, I like to answer questions, but then I, it gives me an ability to really find out what you're, what you're looking for. <clears throat> but if you look at, um, and I don't have a slide of it, I wonder if I could pull something up. The, um, the, uh, a woman's cycle for um, intercourse, there's, you know, the excitement phase, right? Let me, pull, let me see if I can pull something up. <clears throat> there's the excitement phase. Um, and then there's the climax phase, or, and then you plateau. And then there's resolution. And some women can have multiple orgasms. Um, and they're able to kind of cycle through that, the climax over and over. And whether that's with penetration and having G spots, um, or it's having clitoral orgasms. And some, and some of my patients have both and someone have one or the other. Some women don't know how to orgasm. So I, I go back to the anatomy and I show them what an or, how to orgasm. We talk about it, um, we have um, good conversations about you know, positions, um, what, you know, what positions are easiest for them, um, you know, uh, how, what's painful and why it's painful. Um, so, you know, those are conversations I have with, with all of my patients um, who, who ask, depending on, you know, what they're coming in for. Are there any other questions? I'm trying to think of um, what else is there to talk about for sex in your health. You know, most of the things I've been, okay, I have a question here. I think, you know, I, I think that sex drive for women is definitely higher when they're younger. Um, and, and that has to do with the fact that the levels of hormones are higher. In perimenopause, the hormones are lower. And I can tell you that um, women, women are different than men. We're not just hormonally driven, which, which makes it a little, women are more complicated, right? You know, if, if they're romanced and, you know, you wash the dishes, that's very sexy for a woman. That might be the trigger to have them want to have intercourse, right? So it's interesting um, as well that, you know, women, when, you get, when they typically get into the 40s, they're much more comfortable with their bodies, not uncomfortable with, inter, with sex and intercourse and being with a partner. So there's that, com that, there's that component in a woman that, um, you know, like I said, you know, when I talk to my young girls, they're insecure. They turn off the lights and they close their eyes, right? You know, and I say, don't turn off the lights and don't close your eyes. You have to look, you know, a woman in her forties, you know, she's, she's, you know, she's a person who perhaps has had intercourse and um, in, you know, with multiple partners or, you know, even in a monogamous relationship and they're much more comfortable but if they're in a monogamous relationship, then they're definitely more comfortable because they've been with the same partner. They've seen it all, said it all. And if they've been with multiple partners, then they know what pleases them with multiple people and they're much more comfortable with their bodies, just in general. I mean, that's a really overstatement because I have a lot of patients who are very, very uncomfortable with intercourse and, and have been that way their whole life. I have a lot of patients who are in their 50s and are not comfortable with sex as well as in their 40s. Um, and they just, they, they feel as uncomfortable with sex now as the first time they've ever had it. So those are really generalizations, I think, that are kind of sweeping, 
Um, but I would have to say that as a woman gets older, her confidence does increase and she does know her body more, right? So I think that that in general probably is, is it could be something that you're, that you're probably thinking about or seeing. So when we look at women in the 50s, they're not your 20 year olds. They didn't grow up with Google. They didn't grow up with being able to like, you know, Google, what is a, what does a vagina look like? You know, my 20 year olds, <laughs> you know, they have full anatomy lessons. It's, you know, they, I had, I saw a patient today who has a condition on her vulva and I looked at her and I said, this didn't start yesterday. You've had this for years. She says, no, no, no. Just since November. I said, no, no, no. You had, this doesn't develop over, you know, four months. I said, have you ever looked at yourself? She's like, no. <laughs> I thought, okay, you know, generational, right? You know, women in their fifties, it's taboo, right? You know, and so that's a whole different lecture, sex and your health, you know, and I, I didn't get into it because I really didn't review the current literature on it, but the literature I have read and the literature I'm familiar with in my own personal experience in taking care of women, it's very taboo for women to enjoy sex, right? Because then, you know, I mean, I can, I can just spew out a bunch of, you know, slang terms for what we call women who, you know, who quote unquote are like that and they don't want to be that, Right. So it's a cultural thing. I shouldn't enjoy sex, right? I shouldn't pursue sex, right? Um, a cougar, a tiger, right? Oh my goodness. How, you know, how am I being perceived by society? I'm not a nice girl. I, you know I mean? All of these definitions, I think people in society and our society, because not all societies are like ours, um, give women can, can definitely hinder a woman in her ability to have pleasurable sex, right? Because in the back of their mind, they have been taught that sex is, sex is not something that is good. It's not, it's something dirty, right? It's something that we don't talk about, you know? I mean, I remember growing up and, you know, my sex ed education from my mom was very limited, you know? Um, I, you know, it's funny because I, I, I have a story, but I'll, I have to save that for my next lecture. Um, but, you know, the, the, the way women look at themselves or perceive themselves are different from generation to generation. And as we, as we look at our younger patient population and our younger women, they have much healthier um, views of themselves in terms of being much more open. And that's important because, you know, you have to be able to be comfortable with yourself. You know, we all have feelings and we have to be comfortable that those feelings are okay. There's nothing wrong with having feelings. You know, now if you, if you take those feelings and you do things that are, are, are hurtful, then that's different. But feelings are, are normal and they're healthy. You know, it's just, you know, getting into relationships that are safe, again, you know, that are healthy for you, that are mutually respectful, respected. But our older patients, you know, in general, and, and, you know, I have a lot of patients who, you know, I do surgery on and they're in their 60s, you know, and 70s, and, and they, you know, for the first time, they're talking about, you know, their private parts, and, you know, they don't even use the terminology. And so it's really cute, because I always tease them. And then they just, you know, of course, you know, it's, it's nice, because it's a room where it's just the patient and I and they are not being embarrassed by it to anybody else. So I always kid around with them. And they're always like, Oh, Dr. Furlong, oh, I don't, I don't talk about that. And I always laugh with them, you know, and it's, it's interesting, because, you know, we can, we can laugh and can talk about it. You know, but you can see how shy they are about, about their body, how, you know, oh, I don't want to get undressed. Oh my, oh my gosh, you know, you're going to look at me. Oh, and it's not just because, you know, it's someone looking at it, it's, it's how they feel even in, in a bedroom setting. Right. And so if I talk about sex, they're like, oh no. And so, you know, different perceptions. And so how do they get out of that? You know, and how do you, how do you view your body and feel comfortable? You know, it takes time. And so, you know, some women are generationally very, very, it's taboo. It's not good. I shouldn't orgasm. I have a lot of patients who've never experienced an orgasm. And then I talk to them, I say, well, I, let me teach you how to masturbate. Let me talk to you about that. Nope. Don't want to. It's not good. It's not good. I shouldn't do that. You know, and that's their belief and that's okay. You know, everybody has to have their own beliefs and you have to respect them. I just offer it to them. And I tell them if there's ever anything you want to you know, talk about then we can, we can always explore that. Um, you know, but definitely women, I think in general, do get more comfortable with their body and what they want and how to ask for that, right? And that's a, that's a big thing. How do you ask for what you want? Because when you're younger, you know, you may want this position in bed, but you're not, you're too shy to ask your partner or you think that your partner should initiate that. And so there's a lot of, I think women have a lot more 
you know, I, I know men have different types of taboos, but I think women have, have their own set of, of taboos that can definitely, you know, be, uh, that can hinder their ability to have pleasure in sex because it's not, you're, you're not supposed to pursue it. You're, you're supposed to be a lady, right? And, and ladies don't do that. And those are things that I think are still, you know, there's still threads that are, that are in our society that, um, you know, women get into, into their, into, you know, their, their dogma, you know, and their, and their, their philosophies. Um, I, I do think that the internet has changed a lot of that. You know, because it, it opens up a whole different world, right? You need different points of views. You know, you're not just in your own society, um, you know, culture. You know, you're reading what other people think from other communities. Um, you can join chat groups. You can have private conversations. You can see pictures. You can see videos. You know, so there's a lot more out there that I think, and even, you know, as, as women get older, who can explore that? I have, I have quite a number of, of older women who, you know, are very savvy on their, on their smartphone. And I always ask my patients, I'm like, can you text? And they're like, yeah, I text. I say, all right, I'm going to text you. <laughs> I'm going to text you all my information. They're like, okay. <laughs> they're like, oh, that's good. Cause I prefer not to get a phone call doctor for a long, like, all right, you know? And so you see these things, you know, and, you know, it's just empowering women to really, you know, be who they want to be and do what they want to do. Um, and telling them that no matter what their choice is, you know, that they're supported you know, as, as long as obviously, you know, keeps them safe and it's not harmful again. But in general, you know, I, I really think that women should feel comfortable with, with their decisions, whatever they are, you know. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing if, if people want to um, leave messages and, you know, even if it's something that, um, you know, I didn't talk about in the lecture, I can, I can look it up a little bit more um, and get some, some data um, I think sex and your health is, is a broad topic. Um, so I kind of try to give just, you know, a, a, an overview of some things I thought would be, you know, just kind of in general. Um, I think, you know, at the whole, there's a whole topic of, you know, same sex relationships um, that I didn't talk about. Being a urogynecologist, you know, it's hard for me to talk about male um, type of same sex relationships because I don't, I don't, I don't see them and I, I don't know enough about them clinically. Um, but um, I know that, you know, there's definitely a lot more bisexuality um, and that, um, um, so, you know, homosexuality, bisexuality, um, and, and even I, I, I think it's called bisexual, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the term, my apologies. I'm trying to be all inclusive and I'm thinking lesbian, gay, I was trying to think of the acronym. Um, but, you know, I, I, it's not that this lecture is not trying to, to you know, be inclusive, not, you know, all inclusive. It's just that I only have a limited time. And if I was going to talk about that, then I would like to talk about that and really give it a, a, a good amount of time for, you know, same sex or, you know, open relationships, because those are also very important um, for people and for people to feel not judged. Um, so if there are any questions about that, you know, I can always be asked and I can always, you know, either come back and do another lecture or, you know, write a little sample of, of um, information. Uh, I saw the comments and I hope I answered your question. I'm thinking about it a little bit more, sometimes talking off the cuff. Any bleeding with intercourse needs a full workup. Um, and don't assume that it's just a fibroid. So that requires a, a full gynecological workup for infections and other problems, including ultrasound and blood work and cultures and a pap smear. So please don't think that it's just your fibroid that's bleeding because more commonly it's something else and that should absolutely be evaluated. And it depends on a person's age um, and what their risk factors are for that. So please, you know, I take that bleeding is very, very serious. You know, today, honestly, today I, I diagnosed three cancers just today. So, you know, it happens all the time. Bleeding is something that I'm very, very, um, um, I, and I, I didn't address that when I was answering the question, uh, mainly because I was trying to think of some other things in terms of sex for that. Um, and I, and I had to switch gears a little bit. So I just wanted to make sure I, I pointed that out just from a medical standpoint. Women who are in menopause, you know, bleeding could be cancer and women who are younger, it's typically not a cancer, but it's, it can definitely be things that are worrisome that need to be addressed. So I always say to a patient, if you, you know, and sometimes, you know, rough sex can cause bleeding, dryness can cause bleeding, right? Trauma. You know, I've had some patients who come in and have cuts, you know, because 
because of intercourse, but it should always be looked at, you know, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't just dismiss that because that, that definitely, um, that definitely can be something, you know, let, let just let a professional take a look inside and, and, and give you the thumbs up that yes, you're okay. You know, it's just intercourse and then, you know, and then you're good. 